Well, hello. Today I'd like to talk about a transitional pen. Uh, the Esterbrook is famous for its Esterbrook J pens, and uh, they're very common collector's items for people who are just getting into vintage because they're low cost and they're easy to fix, and there's lots of nibs out there. Uh, the transitional came just a little bit before the Esterbrook J. Uh, it's a lot like an Esterbrook J, as you'll see as we take a look at it. And this one has a little bit of a personal connection, so we'll talk about after we look at the pen. Well, this is an Esterbrook transitional pen. What I mean by transitional, so what I mean by transitional, we'll put it down here beside an Esterbrook J pen, which is essentially the same pen, but this was transitional probably during World War II to the models that appeared after, which have a finial on both ends instead of the flat on one end. And I'll show you a couple other differences here. Now, admittedly, the J has a little bit chipped finial, but there's the one on the J. This is the transitional finial. And then on the other end, transitional and the J. But otherwise, they're basically the same. They're both screw cap pens, both basically the same finish, both lever fillers. Um, both use the same kind of nib, both have the same section. So let's turn our attention to the transitional pen. I will just note that it came with a companion pencil, which uh, I have no lead in it right now, but, you know, mechanical pencil. Uh, the nib in this one is a 2968, so it looks like some kind of a relief nib. Lever filler, as I said. Now, if you don't like the nib in it, the unit quickly unscrews, and Esterbrook used to make a wealth of different nibs that you could replace them with. I tend to like these relief nibs that are kind of stub-like. Uh, I've tried their flex nibs, I'm not much of a fan. But uh, they have daily writer nibs, they have manifold nibs, they've got everything you want. So I think for a good old-fashioned pen like this, we need a good old-fashioned ink. So we'll just give it a snort full of Parker Quink Washable Blue. Which could be interesting because the bottle's getting empty. Which is why I have an ink miser. Haha, -ha, you didn't think I'd have a solution. You thought, yes, the rain... Ooh, there's not a lot of ink left in there. The rain of Parker Quink washable blue on this channel is finally over. No, it isn't. So we'll stick it in. You probably couldn't see the bubbles, but there were a lot of bubbles there. I haven't quite figured out how to film filming, or filling real well. I almost think I would need to set up yet another camera to the side. So, I did repairs on this pen. I wish at the time I'd been thinking of my, uh, my pen repair series because I need to do one on set, how to install a sack. I need to do one on the, the J-bar and I need to do one on the push button. Uh, so this one didn't need a new J-bar but it did need a new uh, sack. And, uh, yeah, I missed that opportunity, so we'll just have to try again with another pen. So, we're going to call this with the Esterbrook Transitional. By the way, whatever I said before about the net number, I pulled out my loop there and looked it up. And you can find tables that will give you what all the different numbers mean as far as nib size. Of course, we're using Parker Quink, Washable Blue.
And, uh, you know, one of the complaints I've always had about Esther Brooks is it always seems like the section is just a little bit too short. But remember, these were low-cost pens that were easily available. If you're looking for a nice vintage project, look for an Esther Brook. Uh, you can still find them at low cost, and they are fairly easy to repair, and the parts are out there. So this isn't one of Esther Brooks' flex nibs. Like I said, it's a little bit stub-like. Uh, wetness and flow. Except maybe on their flex nibs is not something I've had trouble with with Estabrook. Maybe you'd like to see me wet and flow. Okay, no trouble keeping up as far as a smear test. I have the feeling this is a wet writer. Yeah, that's pretty wet. Uh, reverse writing. That can be hit or miss with stubs, I've found. Okay, and I'm noticing something interesting now that I've turned it over. Let's see if you can see it. Almost looks like there's some tipping there. But not on this side. So for my commentary at the end of the video, I might have to do a little quick research on this particular nib. Um, and of course the world famous Pierre Gustafson test, which again it's nice to have it on screen. I think it did that very well. So overall, quite pleased with this pen. Now we'll see. For a while I'll write with it and we'll see how I feel when I do the commentary. So that was the Estabrook Transitional. Um, I like it. You know, it, it, for me personally, I don't feel much difference from the Estabrook J in using it. And I shouldn't because it's not really all that different. You know, a little more design here on this finial on the, on the cap. Uh, no finial here. And it does kind of look unfinished that way. You know, the matched pairing of finials on the Estabrook J just is more finished. But, hey, whatever, it's transitional. Uh, does it pass the pocket test? Well, better because the clip is slightly sprung. But, yeah, it does. Slips right on there, but it doesn't hold. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I said this, this pen has a little bit of a personal history. Uh, so way, way back in fall of 1999, I... Moved to North Dakota for some reason. Uh, moved to a little town up in, actually six miles out of Canada, called West Hope. Uh, and you've seen my West Hope video, probably. Uh, but anyway, I lived in West Hope for three years. But moved to West Hope, first time living on my own, and uh, going around town and, you know, figuring out where I'm going to rent. I, I did finally find, I did find a place. I, I looked at two and then I rented this house, <laughs> believe it or not, for 150 bucks a month. Um, again, watch the West Hope video, you'll get an idea why. But 150 bucks a month furnished. It was a two bedroom house. It was a, don't tell my current house this, but a little nicer than the house I live in now. Uh, but, Anyway, I, you know, after I got in there, I just kind of collapsed on the floor and fell asleep. So, not much of a day. But the next day, I started to get out and about in the town, and I met this older couple walking a Cocker Spaniel, who I later learned the Cocker Spaniel's name was Honey. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they introduced themselves. They, they had been the pharmacists in town because at one time there was a drugstore with an old-fashioned soda fountain and all that that was still in all the promotional literature for West Hope, but it was closed. Uh, they didn't find a buyer for the business and uh, they wanted to retire, so they retired. And they were some of the first people to introduce themselves to me. Uh, it wasn't too long after, and I don't want to get into why or anything because that's personal to them. But uh, it wasn't too long after that the husband of the couple passed away. Um, so uh, the, the, the wife of the couple and I would talk from time to time. Uh, 
actually we we got to be pretty friendly you know she she had one of those powerful personalities that just kind of like dominates any room um very nice lady but uh anyway i would take care of her dog when she would go on trips and, you know, Honey, like I said, that was the Cocker Spaniel's name. I'll give the, that name out. Honey was a sweet little dog. You know, I, I was nervous about her at first because she was like, seriously, you're taking me on a walk? And uh, so I just let her lead me around West Hope. You know, I was on summer vacation. So we just wandered where she wanted to go and uh, eventually made it back to the house. And I swear the next time I stopped at the house to take her for a walk. She met she she practically met me at the door with the leash in her mouth. If you know, she could have reached the leash. She was ready to go. So she kind of enjoyed that. And that's that was kind of my relationship with Honey over the the 3 years that I was there. Is you know, I'd take her on walks when uh, this lady was gone and um, I it was kind of horrifying the day I walked into the house and Honey did not want to get up. She just was laying in her corner, and I knew something was wrong, so I called this lady's daughter who lived in another town, and uh, she made her way up, and uh, we took Honey to the vet, and uh, and we found a tick in her ear, which uh, had nothing to do with anything, but Honey was just really sick, and Honey was a very old dog. So we left her at the vet, and uh, this old woman cut her trip short, came back, and... Uh, asked me to take her over to, to the vet, and uh, we picked Honey up. Honey looked good. Um, the one and only time I've let a dog in my house was Honey when this lady brought her to visit me. And uh, Honey lasted a week or two, and then, uh, then she asked me to take her over to the vet again, and uh, the vet had to make the help her make the decision to put Honey to sleep, and... Uh, you know, then I had to drive this woman home, and that was a very hard drive home. But, uh, you know, we kind of stayed in touch, but uh, eventually I left West Hope for, well, <laughs> not greener pastures, maybe more rolling pastures. Um, and eventually made my way down to this part of the state, which is in the southwest corner of the state. Um, but up near, near here is a pretty famous North Dakota town called Medora. It's part of the, it's in the heart of the Teddy Roosevelt uh, National Grasslands, National Park. And, uh, but Teddy Roosevelt actually lived, not in Medora, but near Medora. So the, they Teddy Roosevelt everything there. Uh, I'll have to someday maybe talk to you about Teddy Roosevelt. But anyway, they were doing a big Teddy Roosevelt festival and, uh, you know, I'm a young single man. I <laughs> had no interest in that. But uh, I got a phone call from this old woman. She she remembered me and she knew I'd moved to this town and uh, asked me to come up for the day. So I spent the day with her and uh, another older woman who I'd never met before. And uh, we went to a whole bunch of Teddy Roosevelt stuff. <laughs> and uh, that was the last time I ever saw her. Uh, she did end up in a nursing home and then passed away. I do know that uh, you know when they cleaned out her house... They found some old pens, and uh, the daughter knew that I liked fountain pens, because like I said, I wasn't always a collector of fountain pens, but I bought fountain pens, and I used them all the time. Uh, I only had like three back then, and <laughs> a few more than that now. But anyway, among them was this Estabrook and uh, some dip pens, and I, I'm not a big fan of dip pens, so I've done nothing with those. But this Estabrook, I... I uh, Resacked it, cleaned it out. The J bar was in perfectly good shape, and uh, yeah. So uh, now when I see this pen, I always think of this woman that I met in West Hope. So it's got kind of a personal connection to me, and uh, you know, sometimes things are like that. You know, I would have a hard time get, getting rid of this pen just because of that personal connection. So. Uh, yeah, things don't have feelings. Uh, you give me the choice of, you know, saving the pen or saving myself. Um, saving myself, but uh, you know, it, it is uh, just nice to have things that have a personal connection. You know, have a little bit more meaning. So you hear about Marie Kondo's things that spark joy. That's one way, and you know, I, I realize sometimes that can be used to blackmail you into stuff, and I don't want to get into all that, but. Uh, 
yeah, it's just nice to have a pen with that personal connection. So, anyway, um, it's a variant on the Estabrook J that you can find out there in the collecting world that might surprise you someday. So I thought it was worth bringing up. Well, thank you for watching. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.